Hey, good morning, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. My name is Garrett Sheehan, President and CEO of the Greater New Haven okay. Chamber of Commerce and Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. Hey. We have a great panel for you this morning on diversity and inclusion from our diversity and inclusion council, speaking specifically about our minority owned businesses. We'll let everyone get logged in and then we'll get started. And again, thank you for joining us. We'll get started in just a moment here. Morning, everybody. Morning, Howard, and uh, good morning to everyone who's joining us. We'll, uh, we're just after 10 o'clock, so we'll get started. Uh, again, want to thank our Diversity and Inclusion Council for putting together uh, this program today, specifically geared towards our minority-owned businesses. Uh, my name is Garrett Sheehan. I'm President and CEO of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce and the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. Uh, as always, we want to thank all of our investors who support the Chamber, especially through this time. Our business support powered by Connecticut Natural Gas, Southern Connecticut Gas, and UI. And then all of our investors at all of our different levels, including our premier, key, and also principal investors. We really could not put on this programming and continue to operate the chamber without their support. We have a great panel with us this morning. Uh, we're going to address a number of topics, everything from the stimulus programs, how best to access those, basic financial documents that you may need, and even the reopening. We'll take your questions. Um, first, I'm going to have each of our panelists speak for a few minutes. And then we'll open up to your questions. So you can put those into the Q&A or put those into the chat as we get going. And then uh, once we get to that point of the program, we will start going around and taking those questions. Um, so I'm going to start off first with uh, Howard Hill. Howard uh, runs Howard K. Hill Funeral Homes. And Howard is also uh, now our vice chair of the Chamber's Board of Directors. So Howard, congratulations and, and thanks for joining us. Uh, Howard, just starting off with some of your thoughts on what you're seeing, uh, especially in the black business community, as far as how are they um, being able to survive in this. We already knew we had inequality issues. Those seem to be only widening. What types of things, too, can we, we do to try to address that? Uh, well, Garrett, thank you very much for uh, having this, um, mm -hmm. you know, this webinar. Um, I'm Howard Hill, uh, Howard K. Hill Funeral Services. I know many people probably on the line uh, know uh, the folks, the panelists. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yes, we're definitely, there are some inequities and inequalities that have been longstanding and chronic for, uh, I would say, centuries. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up, Garrett. Um, and, you know, yes, there are challenges within uh, the black business community, but that's actually nothing new. Um, this coronavirus um, it actually just kind of sheds more light on uh, the inequalities and uh, inequitable uh, structures that are in place that prevent uh, minority-owned businesses from succeeding. Um, so um, I'm sure that there are, um, there's, there's a lot of resources out there. Many folks, uh, there are a few folks here on the line that are a great resource um, to, to Black-owned businesses. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I look at this, this pandemic as an opportunity uh, to be able to um, address some of the systemic barriers and the structural barriers. Um, you know, clearly uh, the, the community uh, could, could figure out how to, how to get around these structures. The question is, uh, does the power that be understand what needs to happen? Do they have the will and the guts uh, to be able to make the change? Uh, you know, I've been, um, you know, a strong advocate in, in, in the space of uh, not uh, going to anyone and asking them for anything, but rather going to uh, take what you need. Uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, that, that's sort of the, the fire that you have to have in order to survive. No, no one's going to give you anything. Uh, and I think that as a black business community, we have to 
uh, think a little bit differently about how we've been operating individually, but more, more importantly, how we haven't been operating collectively. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm torn here in three different ways. One, uh, you know, I'm wearing multiple hats. Uh, one, I'm wearing the hat of my business. Uh, first and foremost, Howard Cahill Funeral Services. We've been around for 15 years. Uh, started in New Haven, uh, in Hartford, now in Bloomfield, Connecticut. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been fairly successful. Um, not exactly where I want to be, but we've been doing, you know, very well. I'm, I'm blessed to have a great team around me to be able to sit on, on conference calls like this to be able to advocate for other small minority-owned businesses. Uh, the second, uh, as you said, Garrett, is uh, second hat I'm wearing is that the vice chair of the chamber uh, and looking to uh, definitely looking to uh, think differently about uh, how the chamber uh, has operated over the past 200 years. Is it Garrett? <laughs> it's 200 years, I think. Uh, so 226. 226. 226 years. So as you can imagine, 226 years ago, things were very, very different, particularly for uh, for black people, uh, let alone black business. So uh, the chamber uh, has taken on uh, a new vision, uh, and I'm I'm very excited to be a part of that. Uh, and the third hat is um, I'm wearing the black the hat of the uh, a supporter of the Black Business Alliance, which is uh, somewhat like the chamber, a very very new organization. Uh, it's sort of my brainchild, and uh, it's it's designed around uh, helping black businesses to thrive. Uh, but we have to uh, we have to do more uh, our, ourselves and, and people who have the power they have to uh, recognize and figure out ways to to help uh, help the businesses. Great, thank you, Howard, and uh, we'll we'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, let me now turn to Peter Hurst, and Peter is president of the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council. Peter, uh, what, are, what are some of the issues that you've been working on since we've been in the pandemic? So I think Howard's uh, points are, are very appropriate. Uh, one of the things that COVID-19 has laid bare that there's definitely a racial wealth gap in this country, and that's played out in terms of you know, who's gotten sick, what businesses have not gotten uh, resources from the federal government, and what children have not been able to learn uh, when schools were closed. But having said that, I think that it also is an opportunity to move forward. Uh, one of the things that I think we need to do is convince those in the public sector and the private sector that minority business development is not just the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do because minority businesses make communities stronger, they generate economic output, they create and maintain jobs, they generate incremental tax revenue, and, and we're, we're proud to say, you know, we, we have all minority businesses represented by us, Hispanic owned, black owned, Asian Indian, Asian Pacific, Native American. And I'm proud to share that of the 2.2 billion in, in total revenue that our minority businesses generate, over 55% of that is generated by companies owned by Hispanics, blacks, and Native Americans. And so that's part of what we really, you know, want to emphasize in that, and, and also going forward in terms of employment, 65% of the employees of our minority businesses in New England are ethnic minorities. So they really are, you know, fulfilling the problems of making communities stronger. I, I think that there are two things that, that I want to emphasize. We have a uh, grant from the New Haven Foundation to provide one-on-one -on -one consulting and subject matter training for all types of minority businesses, not just those certified by us. And we've used that to try to, you know, help folks apply for PPP financing, which is, which is something I think is really critical. There have been challenges, uh, no doubt about it, but, but one of the things we have to focus on, like my mother used to tell me, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So despite all of the trouble, there are, uh, 120 billion in PPP funds remaining as of yesterday. And so all types of minority businesses need to get in line and, and take advantage of that. And for those who've been fortunate enough to get PPP financing, you also need to think about compliance because what you wanna do is make sure that you maximize the conversion from a loan to a grant at the end of the required period. So, so I think we can help with both of those and, and Happy to say that, you know, in terms of this particular group, 
the, uh, the Greater New England Council uh, has an office in Boston, and as of November, we have an office in New Haven, Connecticut. So, so we're glad to be part of the community and looking forward to getting more engaged. Thanks, Peter, and uh, appreciate you joining us. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Jim Haran, and Jim is the Executive Director of LISC, Local, Local Initiatives Support Corporation. And, and Jim, we were just talking before we got on, uh, you guys have been doing a lot of work on the stimulus dollars that are out there and also a, a fund that you've been able to offer to businesses. Yeah, exactly. Thanks very much, Garrett, for having me. And thanks for Jesse Phillips, too, from the Chamber for helping to set this up. So LISC is a national community development financial institution. We're based in New York. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut office, uh, which is based in Hartford and operates statewide. A lot of our work over the years has been focused on affordable housing development and neighborhood revitalization. Um, nationally, LISC does a lot of work with small businesses. And so now in response to the pandemic, we've been doing an increasing amount of work with small businesses here in Connecticut uh, on two fronts. One is with the Paycheck Protection Program that Peter was just talking about. LISC is really concerned that, especially in the first round, uh, a lot of the lending was from big banks to relatively large businesses, and that to a great extent, small businesses, especially minority and women-owned business enterprises, were shut out. So we want to make sure that all small businesses, especially minority and women-owned businesses, uh, as well as veteran-owned businesses, have access to the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, if folks are interested, uh, LISC is now participating in the PPP as a lender with our affiliate, Amito, which is the uh, our Section uh, 7A SBA lender. So uh, we have a special focus on hard to serve businesses, including groups with, uh, or entities with uh, language barriers, or uh, maybe they haven't paid their, filed their taxes in recent years. We can help with that, providing technical assistance, walking people through the process, helping them determine whether the PPP is really right for them. As Peter was also just saying, uh, it's a loan. Uh, it can turn into a grant, but only if all the rules are followed. And so we wanna make sure that uh, everybody knows what they need to do. If you're interested in a PPP, you can go to our national website, which is www.lisc.org. There's a COVID-19 page at the top. Um, and uh, then under the Paycheck Protection Program, you can look to see whether the uh, PPP might be right for you. We have a short survey uh, to help screen uh, for that. Uh, LIS can help most entities. There's a couple that we can't help, including uh, entities that have uh, real estate income from either uh, passive activity or as well as active. Uh, so in that case, we won't be able to help. We also can't help if you already have a pending application with another lender. But the good news on that front is that uh, also, as Peter just said, there's a lot of funding remaining in the second round of the PPP, uh, well over $100 billion left. So it's not, uh, if you have a pending application, there should be time to work out whatever issues you have with your current lender uh, to make sure that that goes, goes through. Um, but, you know, our primary goal at LISC is to make sure that everybody has access to uh, the PPP lending program if it's right for you. If you go to our website, we also have a list of from the SBA of all the PPP lenders across the country. So not just trying to drum up business for ourselves, it's really a matter of making sure that uh, the minority and women-owned business enterprises get the access that they need to this program. Um, second thing I wanted to talk about was that LISC has had a number of rounds of funding for grants to small businesses, again, with a focus on MWBEs and veteran-owned businesses. Um, at the state level, we had a round of funding with $100,000 from Citizens Bank. That is now closed. We hope to uh, 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 notify the winners, announce the winners next week. Um, nationally, we've had two rounds of funding for small grants of up to $10,000 for businesses, uh, small businesses, um, with $5 million from Verizon, a million dollars from Sam's Club. There's a third round of funding that's going to open this Thursday. Um, it's again for grants of up to $10,000. We have $2.5 million from Verizon. And again, if you go to the LISC website, you can uh, sign up for it. The Chamber also has a link that uh, may be sent out after this uh, for folks to sign up for notifications of this or other small grant programs uh, that may develop over time. Um, 
that small grant program, I must say, is extremely competitive. We had 118,000 applications nationally uh, for the last round for about 350 winners. But I will say that uh, New Haven has gotten the word around pretty well, and there are a number of New Haven finalists in that grouping. So it's worth your while to apply. It only takes about 10 minutes to complete the survey. Uh, it's on SurveyMonkey, uh, information that you should know off the top of your head uh, for the most part. And also, uh, you will get an email or information back from LISC with other small business resources that could be useful if people aren't fully aware of those uh, at this point. So, um, we, you know, our goal is to make sure that businesses can survive this pandemic. Obviously, this is a huge crisis. We're going to continue to be involved and see what we can do uh, between grants and loans to make sure that businesses survive and, and have the resources that they need to serve the community. Thanks. Oh. Jared, I think you're on mute now. Got to toggle on and off. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Uh, let me uh, turn now to Kathy. Kathy Graves, Deputy Economic Development Director for the City of New Haven and Director of the Small Business Development Program as well. Kathy, thanks for joining us. And uh, let me make sure you're unmuted there. Kathy, um, talk about um, some of the things you've been working on. I know you and I have also talked a lot about the reopening as well. So uh, just a little bit about what we're doing. We offer a lot of technical assistance to existing businesses. We help uh, new entrepreneurs start businesses. Last night, we had our first virtual graduation, which turned out to be really good. It was an eight-week program that's usually done in person over 12 weeks. Uh, 11 weeks, I'm sorry, and it was extremely successful. We cut it down to eight. They wanted more. So we help you start businesses. We have offer access to capital. Over the past three years, we have, along with Joe as my partner in crime, uh, we've put about a million dollars in Black businesses' pockets. So we offer access to capital. We ensure that your credit is right because it's very important if you go through a program such as ours and we're going to tell you we have access to credit, you have to have access to capital. You have to be ready. Planning for this reopening is very important because the planning part is the easy part. The implementation is going to be difficult. That's the, the difficult part. You need to educate yourself around what your needs are because the expectations from your customers are gonna be a completely different. Uh, and we're working with small businesses to assist in making that happen because it's important that you're successful to us. We um, have online training as well for existing businesses. One of the challenges that many of our businesses had going through this EIDL process, the back office wasn't in order. So for our graduates, I've offered five hours of back office support before they get started so that they're starting out on the right playing field. And we'll offer that to existing small businesses as well. Uh, you have to be prepared because we want you to emerge stronger and we're here to help you. Whatever we can do to ensure your success, we're going to be available. And we're just a phone call away. Great, thank you, Kathy. Um, and let me just remind everyone, because we're gonna open up to questions in just a moment. So if you wanna put a question into the chat uh, or the Q&A box, um, and it can really be on, on any topic here uh, that our panelists can address. So. Uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, before we get to questions, let me turn to Joe Williams with the Connecticut Small Business Development Center. And uh, Joe, I think we talk at least a couple times a week. Uh, a lot of that has been around uh, the programs that are out there to help businesses. Yeah, thanks, Garrett. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, the Connecticut Small Business Development Center, since this pandemic and before the pandemic, um, primarily we are the uh, partnership between the Small Business Administration, the SBA, State of Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development, and the center is actually housed in the School of Business at University of Connecticut. And the 14 business counselors that you see, uh, myself, we primarily work with startups all the way up to full-blown uh, small business companies up to around 500 employees or less. Um, during this pandemic under the coronavirus and the CARES Act, we've primarily been focusing on the PPP, the EIDL, um, 
in the first and second round of that, in the first phase of that, um, we pretty much deal with the guidelines. Um, we're waiting on the final guidelines, which Congress is looking at in the Treasury, um, which hopefully will be out by Thursday, we, we anticipate. Um, I know there's a, a later webinar today about the reopening of Connecticut. Uh, Commissioner Lehman will be on speaking at two o'clock um, for that. Now, as everyone's alluded to on this call, it's what do you do afterwards? You know, you receive the money, you know, there's really strict, strict guidelines um, in the PPP. Um, what I've been seeing and hearing is a lot of companies are, weren't even prepared and fully understood their promissory note that the banks have received with them. They're having hard uh, problems of communicating with their bank of saying, how, how is this going to the loan going to turn into a grant? So right now, my department is we have focused on trying to explain what they've signed their lives away for. You know, in eight weeks, there will be an audit. The SBA will sit down with the bank and decide how or whether your loan will be either a partial grant or a full grant. And what is so critical for everyone in this call to understand is the first 10 days. And it's from the date of disbursement, which is most important. Many people, I think, may be disqualified or find it disheartening that are sitting on the cash debating whether or not to bring their employees back, whether it's due, due to health concerns or they're not even open yet. You know, May 20 is not here and only a certain select amount of businesses will be able to open up in our community. And so that's a big concern. Maybe PPP may not even been the best thing for certain small businesses uh, throughout our country to even participate. A wonderful program. It is to alleviate the individuals, the of the you know over 30 million Americans that are presently on unemployment to get back to work before June 30th. That was the ultimate goal. But with that being said, having the tide of not being able to open or having a limited capacity to open, that actually puts many small businesses in a very precarious situation. And we'll try to work through that through strategy. We do have one-on-one -on -one sessions. You can reach any and every one of us if you go to our website at ctspdc.com. You can sign up for free. The, the counseling is free to you. It is paid by your tax dollars. And so I, I encourage everyone to participate with that. Unfortunately, um, EIDL is closed right now. It's only open to the 4 million applications that the SBA is working on presently. Um, as of May 3rd, they've actually issued most of the advance of the EIDL to small businesses. And now they're working through the loan process of that. Um, if you're an agricultural business on this call, you are open to apply, um, and I, I, I encourage you to do so. Also, if you are one of the individual small businesses that in March applied to the EIDO and you received a number beginning with two or 2,000 block, you are encouraged to go back to the federal website of SBA and you have to reapply. They will merge both of your files together and you become on the top of the list because it's a first come first serve basis and it is a numerical order. So for those individuals that have the 3,000 block beginning with that number and you haven't heard anything from the government, don't worry, you are part of the 4 million, but no, if you have a 3-1, that means you're in the first million and so on, 3-2 means you're in the second million, 3-3 three, three, and you're in the 3 million block. So it's just taking time right now, the government's about three weeks behind with the process of going through that. So, but we rest assured you will be at least get an email, if not a phone call, all right, to receive that. And feel free to reach out to anyone on this call. You know, they're all experts in the field. They really understand what is going on out of Washington with the stimulus money. We're here for you. And Joe, uh, let me start with you and we are starting to get some questions in there, but um, you raise a good point. Uh, a lot of questions now that we're kind of later in the process about the timeline. Uh, for the loan converting into a grant. Uh, you mentioned the June 30th date. Um, does that limit the amount of grant that someone can get because we're, we're now under two and a half months to uh, June 30th? Um, and just explain that entire timeline with eight, eight weeks uh, for people to be able to get their employees back in. Well, initially when you, when you get your disbursement, you have 10 days to send out an either email or some kind of correspondence to your employees to have them come back to work. In certain instances, such as you know, salons and barbershops and the like, they're still closed. You know, they have another week or so before they can actually reopen. Um, there's even concerns with when they do, 
you know, do you stagger them or do you bring them all back at the same time? What is key about the Paycheck Protection Program, you must expend 75% of those dollars directly towards your payroll. Now, how you do that, it can be a combination. I mean, some people would advise to even pay some hazard pay to go through that number. Because remember, you receive two and a half times your payroll. So 25% is to go for leases and to pay for interest on um, debt instruments or utilities. But 75%, the bulk of that money is truly to bring back the American public back to work, a paycheck protection program. So if you keep that in the forefront of your mind and re really go back and look at the forgiveness portion on everyone's promissory note. There is a section, I think it's on um, page number three, within all the, all the promissory notes, it actually explains to you the calculation and ways that you will actually be forgiven. And unfortunately, it's kind of confusing. Um, every week or every, every day kind of changes. We get further guidance. And as we get guidance out of Treasury or through the SBA, we will disseminate that. That's what Gary and I have been doing um, at the Chamber. But I know for a fact, they're trying to figure out, knowing that there's a limited amount of time, that individuals have more expenses and the PPP was really not the design when Congress first approved it. And so what they're debating right now and the further guidance which hopefully we'll get by the end of the week, will decide, one, will they push back the June 30th date? That's one concern. Um, will you be able to use um, I think there's something I'll talking about. Well, maybe they'll change it to 50-50. So 50 will be expenses, 50 on payroll. But as of right now, today, you have to take it for the guidelines that we have today. 75% of the PPP must go directly for payroll and payroll expenses only. And 25 of that can go for other expenses, which is explained to you. Hopefully your banker or someone on this call can do that if you give us a call. But truly what we're really dealing with is understanding the 10 day rule first, that you have 10 days to actually contact your employees. If they refuse to come to work, there is guidance that you have to contact the Department of Labor and there's guidance to deal with the FTE count of what, how they calculated your original PPP from last year's numbers. That is the significant portion that starts the forgiveness aspect of the PPP. Very, very, very important. And a lot of, unfortunately, I feel that in our community, we're going to miss out of that timeline of the 10 days of actually bringing back our employees or offering them in some kind of measurable way to take them back off of unemployment. I know it's very difficult with the new stimulus of the extra $600, which will, will carry over to July 31st to convince your employees to come back. But know this with an assurity that the federal government has stipulated within the CARES Act that if Europe able to bring back your employees, you are to do so. And if in the event that an employee refuses to come to work for whatever reason, when you contact the Department of Labor, the Department of Labor will make a determination whether or not they will continue to stay on unemployment or not, not only in the present during the pandemic, but to collect in the future. So there's very critical things that the employer and the employee really should sit down collectively to think about how to move forward. Thanks, Joe. Um, Peter, maybe I'll turn to you on this because I, I saw a couple questions on here about getting access to the program. We all know that was a big issue the first round. Um, I'm sure some people are still having some issues, but it, it has gotten better in the second round. Um, wh what are you telling uh, businesses that you talk to who are unsure of how to go about this? Obviously, the banks is the place, but they're not the only location where people can go uh, to get into the program. I was muted. Sorry about that. Three things. I, I think that you can apply to more than just the largest banks in the country. Uh, in Connecticut, there are a number of banks that have less than $5 billion in assets. I would definitely go to the uh, SBA's website and see if they're a participating lender and apply to those. Secondly, you can also apply to community development financial institutions. There's several of those in Connecticut. Uh, I think Kevco is one. LISC is certainly one. Uh, you can apply for them. And finally, we have sent a lot of folks to banks who are members of the National Bankers Association, which is a group of minority bankers 
that have lent to our constituents throughout the country because we're part of a national network. Uh, so we sent actually the two weekends ago, uh, we had folks from the National Bankers Association taking applications all weekend from across the country with folks with whom they did not have a pre-existing business relationship. So I think that we just need to, to think about potential lending sources as not just the largest banks in the country, because clearly there were a lot of glitches when the program opened up and folks were, you know, beating down the doors and folks like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. So, you know, I, I think that if you look at all of these different sources, you walk in knowing what, you know, documentation that they're going to need, you can expedite and maximize your chances of getting a PPP loan. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Jim, um, there were some questions on here about uh, the rounds of funding. If people have already applied through your programs, do they need to apply again? Uh, and maybe you can just also talk about uh, just even on the local funding program that you had with citizens. Um, I assume the response was dramatic and the need that you're seeing out there. Yeah, so, so two parts. First, with regard to the payroll protection program, uh, if you've applied with a lender and you haven't heard back uh, whether uh, the loan has gone through, you should check in with them because the funding does remain. It may be that there are issues that need to be resolved. So you should check in uh, with your lender to, to make sure to resolve those issues. Um, there is over $100 billion remaining in the current round of the program. You should not wait. Uh, you don't necessarily need to rush out today. Uh, there should be several weeks of funding remaining. But on the other hand, you don't want to wait and get cut short. And it's not necessarily the case that there's going to be a third round of funding. So you should definitely uh, look at this time. Um, and there is a, a list through the SBA of all the different lenders, including community development finance institutions like LISC, minority banks, uh, like Peter just mentioned, as well as the big banks. So uh, check out your, your different options. Uh, with regard to the funding, yeah, we do are seeing a tremendous need. Um, for our round with Citizens Bank funding in Connecticut, we just limited it to the first 100 applicants. And within eight hours, we had the, the 100 applicants that we opened it up to. Uh, nationally, LISC has left these funding rounds, including the upcoming one with funding from Verizon, open for about five days each time. And the last time they did so, uh, there were 118,000 applications nationally. And as I said earlier, we only have about 350 grants to make from those 118,000 applications uh, for funding, for, for grant funding. So the need is tremendous. And we're really focused on trying to make sure that small businesses serving inner city communities, especially those run by uh, women and minorities, are accessing grant funds like this because a lot of times it's the bigger businesses that have gotten resources, whether lending or grants. And so we want to make sure that small businesses serving inner city neighborhoods uh, and residents are, are getting their fair share. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, let me turn to Howard. Uh, Howard, obviously, you're on the front lines of this year in the, the funeral business. Um, and we've seen a lot in the reports that just the virus is having a disproportionate impact uh, in the urban communities. How is that translating to businesses as well? And I know you speak with a lot of businesses, especially in New Haven, as to how they're either able to reopen um, or even uh, get, the, get the doors open and support their community. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Garrett, for asking that question. Uh, you know, as a funeral home owner, uh, we're definitely on the uh, front lines uh, as it relates to, you know, uh, folks that have passed on. Can, can you hear me, Garrett? Thank you. Yeah, I can hear you, Howard. Okay. Oh, okay, great. Uh, so uh, I was actually, I actually been very, very concerned about that, uh, as you, as you know, being on the reopen committee. Um, you know, people are are dying at home. Um, you know, I know that the governor is um, really basing uh, his, um, you know, his his uh, reopening based on uh, the hospitalizations. But there are many people, many, many, many people dying at home. Uh, so um, you know, it's how that how that impacts business. Uh, clearly, it's going to impact business, uh, particularly small businesses. Uh, for example, we have um, you know people who who own real estate, 
And I know that there are people who can't afford, they're, they're out of work and they can't afford to pay their rents. Well, a lot of these small business owners, uh, you know, in addition to their small businesses, they own real estate. So now they're not, they don't have rental income. Uh, for their properties. So this is this is like a trickle down effect in, in many ways uh, that, you know, as I said in the beginning, uh, sheds light on a much broader issue. One one of the things that I, I, I want to make sure that uh, people understand is that uh, being in crisis uh, for black business owners, for black people is pretty common. Um, we, we exist in crisis mode. Most of us do. Uh, most of us are just one paycheck, one job, one or two jobs away from financial disaster. Um, and we tend to kind of float and survive that way. Um, so uh, I look at this coronavirus uh, as an opportunity to make systemic and structural changes to be able to help the community the black business community and the black business, I'm sorry, the, the, the black community as a whole. Um, and in the future, it may not be direct help now, but if we do the right thing, a hundred years from now, things are gonna look different. So for example, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King has, has been talking about, he talked about things that we're talking about today. Uh, and it seems as though the needle is not moving. So my, my, my viewpoint and BBA's viewpoint is not now, uh, per se, of course, because we'll figure out how to survive right now. We, we've been surviving for all of this time. But 50, 60, 70, 100 years from now, how will our community look based upon decisions that we make today, the opportunities that we have in front of us today, are we focused on equality or are we focused on equity? One of the other things that I would also say to you is that there's, there's, an, there's an optics uh, to, to, to this whole idea of stimulus and receiving help that impacts the psyche of the black community. You know, there is a, there is a you know, you, you probably would never hear it um, from uh, a lot of black folks, but I'm just gonna open it up uh, just so you understand how deep this is. When black folks have to go, always go to outside of their community to receive help or receive information that helps them to survive or thrive, what that does is it reinforces uh, a stigma that black people are inferior. So we have to, we as the black community have to focus on our mindset to understand that literally we are the resource, right? So uh, if you think about it for a little bit, as I talked to you a little bit earlier, Gary, uh, inclusive growth was the only thing on people's mind prior to COVID-19. And everybody had their uh, rendition of what inclusive growth meant. Um, in my head, inclusive growth, the foundation of inclusive, inclusive growth was equity right? Not equality. I don't need the same amount that you have. You know, uh, I need more because I'm at a deficit, right? So to me, that's equity. So we have to, as we deal with this COVID-19 process, we can never ever forget equity and we can't include the concept of inclusive growth. And we have to hold the, the leadership, we have to hold their feet to the fire as a people. That's a long-term focus. It's not an immediate focus. It's a long-term term focus. And I think we have to have double vision. You know, in the Black community, we have to have double vision. Because if we don't, we may succeed in our lifetime, but we let our future generations down. This is a mindset issue for Black communities. And this is something that we have to tackle. We also have to explain to people outside of our community that there is a way that you have to go about helping our community. You can't always be in charge. You can't always be on top. You have to step aside. You have to understand how to step aside and assist and not be in control of how things are administered in our community. We have to be in control of things in our community. Thank you. All right, we'll just end the webinar there. No, thank you, Howard. I appreciate it. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Um, let me turn to uh, Kathy now. And uh, Kathy, we, uh, one of the things we've been talking a lot about is, is reopening. Um, is, is that look any different 
uh, in the urban community with for our minority owned businesses or is it are there just uh, natural guidelines that everyone should follow? In addition to the guidelines that have been uh, laid out by the governor, yes, it does hit the minority community at a different level, simply because, as Howard mentioned, we're behind anyway. So we have to be able to make things available to them that has thrown them further behind. For example, there are many businesses out there that have really been cash businesses. And as a result of them losing the cash over the past three months, it has set them further behind. And we're requesting them to adhere to guidelines that's going to require them to spend money just to open their door. So yes, minority community has been hit hard and any of the small businesses that have been in that same situation, they're gonna have a challenge starting. One of the things we're discussing at the city, and I think Garrett, we have discussed it too, is what can we do to help them open their doors without them spending money? So how can we make ourselves available to help them open doors? However, if we do it for one, we have to be able to do it for all. So if you're a legitimate business and you have all your paperwork in order, we should be able to help you. And I think that we're talking about how can we help these individuals open their doors because that's going to be the key without that cash outlay. That's true. Um, we're we're going to take a few more questions um, here and then we'll, we'll turn to each of our panelists uh, for a, a final uh, thought. I, I do want to mention there was a question about, you know, what, what about other uh, minority owned types of businesses? Um, we, we're going to continue this conversation. I know there's a focus today on, on the black owned uh, business. Um, many of the topics we're covering cut across all small businesses, uh, frankly. Um, but, but definitely there are uh, variations within different communities and parts of our, our region. And so we will cover those in, in future webinars as well. We don't want you to think that this is to the exclusion of anyone. Um, Joe, let me uh, turn to you before we kind of do a final comment with everyone. Um, just some more questions here about uh, some of the incentive programs. Uh, I saw a question about the, uh, and I should say EIDL, that stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loan for anyone um, who was wondering about that. That's the program run through SBA. So there was another question in there, Joe, about um, if they should wait. Uh, I believe they actually gave even their, their number in the process, but you've said a lot about this, about, about what to do for EIDL. Joe Williams. Yes. <laughs> well, right now, unfortunately, the EIDL is only open to agricultural type of businesses at the present time. Um, and only those that had applied previously that were issued a number, loan number beginning with a 2,000 uh, or two. Um, those are the only ones that are allowed to go to the portal of SBA to apply to the EIDL. Um, the hey, Joe, I got someone with a 3,000 block number, they're saying. Okay, the 3,000 block number, you just need to be patient. More than likely on May the 3rd, you should receive your advance, which is the grant portion of the CARES Act up to 10,000 is based on the number of employees or so per one employee is equals to $1,000. You have three employees, you're gonna get $3,000 in that advance. You do not have to pay that back. That is the grant portion of the idol. Um, but right now, the government has decided though, unlike the first phase that happened a few weeks ago, they've lessened the number um, that you will receive. It has been capped at no longer at 2 million. It is at 150,000. Um, that came out um, as of yesterday. Um, and the PPP is, is more, that, that is still the same. You know, go to your bank based on your, your payroll um, numbers. That's how you, you multiply that and calculate it 2.5%. The EIDL though, unfortunately, to, to make sure that we can help as many small businesses in this country as possible, the federal government has now limited through treasury that amount will only max out at 150,000. Um, so if you were in the first tranche, you know, many people were receiving half a million, million dollars for those businesses that could qualify for that. 
that has now been streamlined and has been has been dropped down to 150k unfortunately and and just to clarify on that joe i thought i heard you say may 3rd for distribution is it for someone who hasn't gotten it yet uh should be any time now or yeah may may 3rd was the date officially that treasury everyone that had a loan number they were, were sent out their advance as of may the 3rd what everyone's now waiting for is the loan portion of the EIDL. And unfortunately, that is a two to three week process of delay because only Fort Worth, Texas and SBA is actually pushing all these loans through. So in the phase one, you would actually get a phone call and an email from your loan officer. In the, the last phase that just happened in the last two weeks, they're not doing that. They're simply sending you your advance, sending you out an email saying you're in review, please be patient. So I would tell anyone on this call, uh, you could go directly to the SBA's website. There is a customer service number and you can look up your status. If you do not hear anything by Friday, you can go to our website, register. We do have a tracking mechanism to get to the back office to track down particular um, loans that have been waiting in queue for more than a month. Okay, thank you, Joe, appreciate it. Uh, Peter Hurst, uh, some closing thoughts from you. Again, appreciate Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council having a location here in New Haven and for you being a part of this uh, program. So, so two things. Uh, one, I think that anyone who's in business now probably needs to think about pivoting. Uh, you survive, which I hope you do. I don't think business as usual is gonna be successful going forward because the world has changed in ways we don't really appreciate right now. Secondly, if you're not uh, of the faint of heart, now would be a great time to think about starting a business. Uh, I know that sounds crazy, but I think that those who are uh, able to take risks and have some innovative ideas, now's the time if you can get capital, and get customers, you're walking into a situation where the risk is, is all on the table and is upside in front of you. Thank you, Peter. Jim, some closing thoughts from you. Sure, one, I just, I saw one of the questions was about uh, going to a bank and uh, that person had a relationship with and they weren't able to process their loan. I would suggest if they're looking for a PPP loan that not every uh, lender requires that you have a pre-existing uh, banking relationship with them. So go to the SBA website or contact the SBDC, or you can look uh, to the LISC website, uh, but others will process loans even without a, a banking relationship for somebody who's stuck uh, and their, their own bank won't process a loan for them. Um, second, to, uh, to Howard's point and, and some of what Peter was saying, talking about inclusive growth and looking to where the economy goes after this. Um, probably most of the folks that are participating today are very aware of the huge disparities that exist uh, in our society, but the pandemic has really exposed those for, for the whole world. And so I do think and hope that going forward, there can be more efforts to build a more equitable society than the one that we've, uh, than we have right now that has resulted in people of color more likely to get the virus, uh, blacks dying at a higher rate than, than whites, uh, as well as the huge economic disparities that we face. So I, I'm hopeful that there can be conversations among uh, the chamber and the uh, folks involved in this webinar, as well as the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, I know, along with the other community foundations in the state, looking at this issue of uh, the need to build a more inclusive economy uh, uh, an economy that works for everybody. So um, let's hope that as we go forward, we can all be engaged in those conversations to, to build a kind of world where uh, there is much more equity and uh, people are on equal footing, uh, not the way that we've seen in this crisis. Thanks. Well said, Jim, appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, Kathy, I can turn to you for some closing thoughts. I think I totally agree with Peter. An existing business, you should really consider pivoting at this point. It's time to be innovative. Uh, yes, it's a challenging time, but make sure your business remains relevant and look to fill some gaps because there are a lot of gaps out here. 
And this is the perfect opportunity. See, this is an opportunity to start a new business. And we're here to help. We're here to assist you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I'll give Howard the last word. So let's go to Joe for a uh, closing thought. Joe? Well, thank you, Gary, for putting this together. Um, I echo everyone's sentiments um, thus far. And the only thing I'd like to, stay, to tell everyone is stay encouraged. You know, this is a definitely a trying time through this pandemic, but it, it's, it's an opportunity to find downturns or, or things that are catastrophic. This is where people make, you know, their future. You know, if you look at some of the most successful people in our country, they didn't make their wealth when in, all in good times. It was some of the worst times that some of the wealthy people in our country have made a significant difference. So I think stay encouraged, know there are resources out here in the community. We are here for you. Um, there's no doubt about it. Please reach out to us. Good to see you, Peter, it's been a while. Um, and so it's good to see some of my old friends on the call and to know that we are out here in the front lines helping small businesses, individuals of color thrive and grow here in the state of Connecticut. So thanks, Gary, for putting this on. I look forward to many more. Thank thanks you again, Joe. Uh, Howard. Uh, Garrett, thank you uh, for uh, convening this, uh, this discussion. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Uh, I think this is a, a, a very fruitful discussion. I'm hopeful that um, people got information that is helpful for them in their business uh, to help them to grow. Uh, certainly agree with, uh, with Mr. Hurst uh, and Kathy said as far as uh, being more innovative about uh, the business. Uh, this is an opportunity to pivot. Uh, also uh, an opportunity to start businesses. As Kathy said, there are many, many voids out there. And for the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, spirit-minded person, uh, this, is, this is a very, very fertile ground uh, for them. Um, uh, you know, uh, to the people who are on uh, the call today, um, you know, I know that uh, uh, Jeff Klaus is on, on the call. Hi, Jeff. Uh, you know, thank you for being on the call. Thank you for your support over the years. Uh, Anne-Marie McKnight, uh, the uh, new leader of the Black Business Alliance. I know you're on the call. Robin Porter, uh, Carlton, uh, and Brenda O'Neill. Uh, I, I see a lot of friends of mine. Thank you all for being on the call. Uh, Jesse Phillips, thank you for, uh, you know, for, um, for your leadership in the diversity and inclusion at the, the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commer Commerce. Uh, I am um, very much excited. Uh, I'm very much uh, encouraged uh, by uh, Garrett, by your leadership and your willingness uh, to talk about tough issues as it relates to minority, uh, particularly black owned communities. Uh, you know, tip, everybody knows me, you know, when I talk about support uh, and I talk about advocacy, I'm talking about black uh, businesses and black community. It doesn't mean that I care less about any other minority community. Uh, it's just that most often when, uh, when we use the word minority, uh, most often African Americans and black issues kind of get washed away, uh, washed away and left behind. Uh, I, I'm more focused, I'm most focused, focused on the wealth gap. Uh, and, and this is why equity is so critically in, important to us. But in closing, what I'd like to just remind uh, anyone who is trying to advocate, trying to help uh, black communities. Uh, understand, understand that a lot of these issues have been around for an extremely long time. For black people, double vision, right now and in the future. For people who are not of the black community, I would say respect, uh, respect the needs. Listen to people within the community they will tell you how they need to help, but respect that. When, when, when they speak up, listen and respond, do not ignore. Uh, we have a lot of work to do collectively as a, as a, as a global community. Uh, and I look forward to doing that work uh, with the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce and also the communities uh, of color. Thank you. Howard, thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. And, and words that we definitely wanna live by and operate by. Uh, not only through this crisis, but as we continue to move forward. I want to again thank all of our panelists for being on here. Uh, all of your organizations uh, are a huge support system uh, for our entire business community. I strongly encourage everyone to 
uh, access them. There's great tools out there. Um, we, we'll make sure that everyone's uh, listed on the Chamber website, our Diversity and Inclusion Council, uh, who helped us put this together. Uh, we will have a reporting on our website as well. Also just want to mention, uh, we did, we were able to run a, a business assistance fund with the support of Wells Fargo. Um, and so we're going to be announcing those awards uh, by the end of this week. Again, just as, as Jim mentioned, a, a tremendous amount of need out there. Um, so we appreciate everyone, everyone who applied. Uh, we're also later this week going to launch a program, uh, our trusted advisors program. So um, Bloom Shapiro, and also Markham have uh, stepped up to help us start that, but offering 30 minute counseling sessions for free uh, that businesses, for businesses that just need uh, some direction as to how to get started. So we'll have more on that at the end of the week. And I just wanna say at the end too, that you know this, the chamber, uh, as Howard said, we've been around for 226 years. We really are a chamber for everyone. Uh, during the pandemic, we're operating for all businesses that are out there. Uh, but we are a chamber that is, is here to support all businesses, uh, however they come in. So we, we hope people understand that and please access our resources that we have and, and consider being a part of our organization. So thank you again, everyone. We'll continue to run these webinars and, and hope everyone has a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.